It is my tremendous honor to address you, our distinguished audience, uh, and a collaboration with our expert panelists to chair this most intriguing and exciting virtual roundtable panel titled The New Wave of Economic Prosperity, Economic Returns Plus ESG, on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Extraordinary Meeting, USA 2021. The introductory summary of this panel is ESG, CSR, triple bottom line, social impact have long been embraced by social impact and philanthropic communities, but considered as PR buzzwords for greenwashing by many investors and corporate, larger corporates. What does this trend towards a great reset and new governmental and institutional initiatives uh, focused on sustainability mean for corporate and financial governance? If economic returns for ESG focused investments were comparable to conventional investment returns, would this be the catalyst to redirect much needed trillions towards socially impactful alternative investments? We are, ladies and gentlemen, on the cusp of a new wave of economic prosperity. Are we or are we not? How will this situation potentially unfold? Interesting questions considering we are still suffering the repercussions of a pandemic. What are the disconnects? What are the key alliances that need to be cultivated further between project donors, private and institutional investors and governments? What economic, governance, ethics and other models, metrics and modalities need to be taken into consideration? What is the role of technology now and going into the future? These are all key questions to also consider. Recent US, UK and other policy shifts and incentives towards sustainability, alternative energy, gender equality, and related initiatives at the governmental, corporate, institutional levels, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals seem to be gaining momentum. The purpose of this panel is there is, is has for some time been great discussion about the growth of the alternative investment category of ESG and social impact investments, and the question as to why it has not grown as substantially as it could have in the past. What would it take to one day be an alternative investment category of choice at the private and institutional level in order to finance projects, businesses, industries, providing positive social impact under ESG principles? With the flow of private wealth transfer occurring over the forthcoming generation from the baby boomers to the next generation inheritors, at the apex of this phenomenon, are the next gens to the ultra high net worth and family office community who are more tech savvy, interested in social impact investments and their and their than their patriarchs have been. Uh, and they've also been a solid source of investment for social impact in ESG areas uh, with which they are passionate about, interested, focused and aligned with their personal values. <clears throat> they often provide the much needed 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, and in some cases, 100 million plus in early stage investment uh, that is often considered a higher risk to institutional investors. I'm addressing the specific topic of the greatest wealth transfer in US history later today at 4.15 uh, p.m. standard time on a separate panel to focus on, on that specific issue. However, at the larger institutional level, where allocations generally start at 100 million uh, or more, Regulation is more stringent. There is a more sophisticated risk profiling, governance protocols, and greater chains of command. How do we bridge the gap between these two worlds of private investment and institutional? Now the window of opportunity is here to grow the alternative investment category of social impact and ESG investments to another level. Private equity, hedge funds, venture capital, etc., were new and had limited uptake at one time. Now they are all large and legitimate alternative investment segments with substantial institutional private assets under management. With several driving forces, such as the next generation of family offices and ultra high net worth individuals as initial investors, with strong interest in impact and ESG, new government policies and incentives, the financial capabilities of the institutional investors, substantial influence of technological innovation, and transfer, which expands scalability and globalization, new perspectives pertaining to proper governance, 
changes to regulation, etc. The opportunity is amongst us now to execute a new wave of economic prosperity. Is providing economic returns commensurate with conventional investments the answer to growing ESG and social impact as an alternative investment category of choice? For this reason, we have assembled this tremendously expert panel that separately represent and are experts in family office, next gen, entrepreneurship, ESG, institutional, ethics, uh, regulation, and proper governance to see if or how we can bridge this gap. So without further ado, may I introduce our distinguished panel. Firstly, uh, Philippa, Philippa Foster Buck, Director of the Financial Markets Standards Board of the United Kingdom. Welcome, Philippa. Jane Valls, who is the Executive Director of the GCC Board Directors Institute, UAE. Julia Paino, uh, who is the founding partner of Trophy Holdings USA. Professor Bob Garrett, who is the director of Good Governance Limited United Kingdom. Peter Dolan, senior climate solution specialist of Claimate USA. Alessandro Melli, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Ethics. Finn UK, Aylwin, who is director of ATOS Limited and ATOS Holdings uh, of the United Kingdom. Now, look, social impact and ESG as an investment specifically and related governance. Each of you are, are being approached with many proposals on a regular basis and possess strong areas of expertise uh, in a key component of this area. So, in approximately one minute, um, what would you just like to kindly share a little bit about your background, how you became interested in the area of social impact, economic returns and ESG and its proper uh, governance? Uh, why don't we start with you, Philippa? Thank you, Peter. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, I've spent the last 20 years uh, running a UK based uh, international charity called the Institute of Business Ethics, helping organisations apply ethical values um, to their business and uh, to bring together their purpose and, uh, and their values and their mission in how they do their business. Uh, this has included uh, the role that business plays in society and its societal impact. Um, and so with now the focus on uh, uh, environmental, social and governance reporting, ESG, uh, the dial's shifting further into the areas that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. But my main interest lies in the governance and oversight of business. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Jane, same, same, same question. We'd love to learn a bit more about your background and how you became involved in this area. Thank you, Peter, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm the executive director of the GCC Board Directors Institute based in Dubai and covering the six countries of the Gulf, of which the largest is Saudi Arabia. Um, we work with boards and board directors in the region to improve their effectiveness, to help them really better understand their roles and responsibilities and the wide range of topics that are on the agenda today, including corporate responsibility, sustainability and ESG. Um, I've been working in the field of corporate governance for over 20 years now in different roles, and I've really seen the notion of corporate responsibility evolve from corporate social responsibility to what we call corporate sustainability today. And it's evolved from being that kind of nice thing to do, the bolt-on approach, to really being a fundamental business strategy to create long-term value, what I call the built-in approach. And I really believe that boards ignore it at their peril today. Um, I became passionate about this subject, particularly sustainability, um, from first listening to Professor Mervyn King that some of you may know. Um, he's from South Africa, um, and I remember listening to him 15 years ago, and he's been an inspiration and a mentor to me on this subject. Thank you very much, Jane. And uh, Julia, uh, same question. We would love to know how you became so interested and focused on this exciting area of ESG. Great, and thank you, Peter, and thank you to everyone. Happy to be here today. You know, I started my career briefly actually on assignment with National Geographic out in Alaska, doing work to understand the environmental implications of many industries working up and down throughout the Unic Valley. 
And from there, I was actually inspired to go back into sort of the business world and understand also how to be looking at investing in different industries. And so I joined an early sort of uh, boutique asset management firm where we built our own ESG framework as we were analyzing public companies and brought that knowledge into what spun off to be a venture arm focused on early stage innovation across energy and food and health. And that really stuck with me and actually something that I've carried in my work um, now as co-chair of the Nexus Global Organization on Impact Investing and into my current role as founding uh, founding member of Trophy Holdings and a strategic advisor to the Desert Boom Food Vehicle. Thank you very much, Julia. And Bob, uh, same question. Uh, how did you uh, become involved in the area of um, ESG and economic returns? Um, well, I started in architecture and architectural education. And the interesting thing about architecture is you have to combine the arts, the science, economics, anthropology, and all these things. Um, and as uh, you really have to um, create buildings or you have to create organizations to be able to do all that. And I was much more interested in the organizational side um, and uh, developed really um, action learning so instead of doing a lot of um, paper-based uh, teaching or anything like that, we were actually taking live projects out of the community and developing them in real time as part of the architectural coursework and using the, uh, the faculty as consultants, um, the specialized faculty as consultants, which is a fairly radical way of doing things. Um, this led me through the action learning to meet uh, Adrian Cadbury way before the Cabaret report, and he and I were working on new types of organizations. Uh, and he introduced me to the notion of corporate governance, which he was writing some some report or other about. Um, well, I wasn't quite sure at the time what that was about. Um, uh, and uh, very quickly, I got into boardrooms talking around these issues, um, which led me through to corporate governance, which led me. Through... But I'm uh, always critical. I think of we've just lost episode. Bob for a second. Sorry, uh, he, he may be back. We, we uh, you, you're back, Bob, yes. Yeah, okay, um, I was always critical of ESG because I don't think it's uh, sufficiently broad. You wouldn't be surprised with my background about that. So I'm talking about EES, so entrepreneurship, environmental impact, social impact, and then plus G with governance as a major oversight issue of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you kindly, Bob. And Peter as well. Uh, what led to your interest and passion in the area of... Uh, sustainability and ESG. Thanks, Peter. And you know, if the trace it to its origins, I guess, comes from studying as a as a conservation biologist in, in university and, and really thinking about it from the perspective of I can better understand the science about what's going on around climate crisis. I can go communicate it uh, and be impactful in that way. Pretty quickly saw the limitations of that and you know, wanted to figure out Okay, how can I be a part of you know, really sort of systemically influencing capital flows and policy around you know, projects, corporate governance, you know, whatever it may be that that would lead to, you know, the, the potential solution or at least you know, effective mitigation adaptation of the climate crisis. And, you know, at the highest level, uh, I got into this because it's it's life or death. Uh, you know, I'm 25, the year 2100. I, I you know, hopefully, God willing, will still be around. I have kids. They'll be they'll be in their sixties. They have kids. They're they're my age. You know, these are people that I, that I theoretically will care about and love. And and uh, you know we've got to take immediate action at a large, unprecedented scale for me to you know have any sort of ability to live with a clean conscience and and you know creating a family and building a life. And and so you know ultimately at, at the highest level, that those are the stakes, and that's sort of what what drives me on the. You know, and ESG is a manifestation of what, what I think is a good vessel for driving beneficial action in that dimension. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, Alessandro, same question. Uh, you had a, a career in the city of London and then transitioned heavily into the, the ESG space. We'd love to hear about, about that transition. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, you know, my, my experience has really been an entire lifelong uh, journey. And, um, you know, f a few events that really led me to uh, and pushed me to grow into a more aware uh, entrepreneur and uh, financial professional and investor. Because, you know, coming from investment banking, uh, I became entrepreneur because of the global financial crisis. So I was fortunate enough that um, I left the industry because of the crisis. 
and then became an entrepreneur. And that really started, you know, to uh, sort of um, make me think about what can I do, you know, to be useful and more meaningful. And in that process, uh, I really realized that uh, there is so much that finance and business can do. And uh, for me, it was really a, really a personal epiphany when, uh, you know, working as an entrepreneur, I started to see the challenges of building businesses and uh, working with clients and working with uh, partners which meant that I sort of uh, uh, broke down some barriers that I had in my mindset, you know, between what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means uh, to make money versus what it means uh, to be a good person. And so that's where ethics came into, into play. And I realized that there are so many flaws in the system that we've built, you know, in society. But, you know, I, I was looking at, you know, finance uh, 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 principally, and I really realized that I had in my mindset, in my mind, a, a strong um, separation between, you know, ethics and doing good, you know, as an individual versus uh, how to become a successful, um, you know, banker, entrepreneur. And so out of that separation, I realized that, you know, combining the two, you know, becoming, uh, you know, ethical, financial, professional, it was really all about breaking down my own mindset and trying to find an alignment, you know, in what I do as a person vis-a-vis -vis what I do professionally in order to promote uh, a better way of doing capitalism, a better way of doing finance mm -hmm. uh, in order to improve, um, you know, our societal systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Okay, now we'll go to, to the, uh, our next question, which will really go to the heart of the subject matter uh, and, the, and the narrative of, of this discussion. Look, digging deeper into this new wave of potential economic prosperity, um, the terms ESG, CSR, tri triple bottom line, impact, et cetera, et cetera, have long been embraced by the impact and philanthropic circles, as we're all well aware. But uh, it's it's the large, it, it, but they're considered PR buzzwords, greenwashing by many investors uh, and large corporates. Uh, in particular, of course, I mean, from the family office and investment world, we're bombarded frequently with these types of in, in, in investments. And we've got to do a thorough analysis to see that they are legitimately providing the impact that they claim uh, they, are, they are going to execute. But with this trend towards a great reset and the new governmental and institutional initiatives, focused on sustainability in the US and other nations, you're all knowledgeable um, of uh, corporate and financial governance, ESG and the social impact investments. I mean, what from your perspective uh, is gonna be the direction forward and your thoughts on corporate and financial governance of ESG and social impact investments from your view? Why don't we start with yourself, Philippa? Uh, you're muted. Yes, I'm unmuted okay. now. Yes, yeah. Sorry, it took me a little bit. Um, I think uh, well, one of the gr the great things about this uh, this great reset actually is um, uh, the, the the different questions that are going to be asked of companies. Uh, I think this is a whole new area that perhaps hasn't really been explored yet to really understand about their impact. I don't think companies really understand what their own impacts are. Um, charities uh, have been struggling for years and to try to describe what their impact is. And I don't think companies um, uh, are able to do that yet. They can do it in environmental terms. Uh, they're fine, struggling again in social terms to actually get what are the right uh, metrics and the right sort of language uh, for this, um, uh, let alone actually, um, you know, reporting on what they're actually doing. Um, so I think I think there are quite a, a few areas that people need to think about. Uh, one of the interesting ones that's just come out is the um, there's a report that was in the FT today mentioned about 45 uh, companies of the FTSE 100 now have ESG in the remuneration models. So I think that's another new area in this great reset that um, thinking outside the box as to what the usual questions have been when people are assessing uh, these sorts of issues. Indeed, indeed. And Jane, uh, as well, I mean, you're, you're, you're obviously an expert on developing market, the Middle East. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, uh, from this situation with the Great Reset, new governmental and institutional initiatives um, regarding corporate and financial governance of ESG and impact? 
So I think this is a relatively new subject in this part of the world. There are certainly companies that have been uh, leading the way and have embraced this topics for some time, but the majority of companies, this is still relatively new in this region. Um, we're still an oil-driven you know, economy in this region, and that maybe have held other types of thinking back in some ways. Um, I think that there's still a lot of skepticism. I don't think it's just in this region, but I think I, I, I feel that it's worldwide about you know, ESG and whether it's just another fad. Um, but as I said in my introduction, I don't think it is clearly. And I think it means that boards can no longer afford to ignore sustainability and ESG, nor can they just sideline it to their sustainability department and say, I've ticked the box. Um, I think it needs to be on the agenda they need to embed it in the DNA and the strategy of the organization for it to be successful. Um, in this region, Peter, we, um, you know, with the decline in, in the price of oil um, and, and the understanding that you know, oil is not going to last forever uh, or, or you know, people won't want it forever, um, is the idea that we need foreign direct investment in the region. And therefore, we need good governance. So we've seen all the regulators improving the standards of, of, of good governance um, in the region. And I think that therefore, we need to be more responsive in, in the GCC to the needs of investors. And therefore, we need a greater understanding and awareness that ESG is no longer a niche topic in the capital market. Um, there's been a huge growth in global sustainable investment assets and we now have plentiful research, I think, to show that ESG factors can improve equity returns, are leading indicators of risk, and that companies leading the way at ESG are tapping into multiple potential sources of new value. And so I think that this is uh, really important for companies in the region to engage. That would be my, uh, and they're beginning to engage. And we're seeing the regulators beginning to engage as well, which I think is a key. Yes, indeed, indeed. And Julia, again, uh, same question. Uh, we've we've got a great reset. New governmental and, in, and institutional initiatives are here. Uh, what do you feel, based upon your background and knowledge, this means for corporate and financial governments of ESG and impact? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think you know one thing I reflect on is, especially with this pandemic, there has been that much strain on communities, on our society, on environmental implications, and there's a really, I think a deeper wave around thinking about resiliency. And of course, in my own personal role within Trophy Holdings, we focus so deeply on what it looks like to just identify solutions for a more equitable, sustainable food system. But beyond food and understanding where, you know, if you're not looking at these different systemic risks, if you're not looking at management in a certain way, there's also this much deeper critical view around diversity and inclusion in various solutions and in various initiatives and companies from the public markets into the private markets. You know, I think that you can also look to how a series of even disruptive climate related events have, of course, had their unexpected devastation and recovery challenge and significant sort of economic burden on the world. And so more capital is sort of flowing into this space. We're seeing so much more capital going towards renewable energy, efficiencies and technologies, resilient infrastructures. And I think that it is sort of intuitive that there's going to be more successful strategies coming out of trying to face the challenges of sort of what's going on at an environmental level, at a societal level, helping to solve for problems with the growing population. So again, so much of what we see sort of extends within the framework of food and resiliency, but I think that same mm -hmm. framework can be applied in so many different other industries as well. Now, that's an interesting perspective, uh, Julia, because you, again, you are an entrepreneur yourself, but also uh, a co-chair of Impact at the Nexus Group. So you're very much tapped into the perspective of the next generation, the great wealth transfer and how to interface with institutions, which is a very, very intriguing position to be in. Uh, Bob, uh, I can't see your face, but uh, uh, are you there? Uh, your yeah. screen has gone, 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 gone black. Are you there, Bob? I'm fairly sure I'm here. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Hmm? Bob? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can't seem to see Bob for some reason. I'm not no, sure why. So, uh, Peter, okay, can I'll, you I'll, hear I'll skip me? over to uh, to Peter for a moment, only because I just can't hear Bob. Uh, Peter, again, okay, same question. Okay, we're we're in a great reset now. There's new initiatives coming up in the U U.S. and in internationally. What does this mean for corporate and financial governance of ESG and impact, in your opinion? Yeah, I appreciate it, Peter. So, you know, immediately, immediately think of two two things. So, so the first comes from my background as a ESG investor. I started my career working uh, for an institutional asset manager 
supporting ESG due diligence and integration in sort of asset, institutional level portfolios. And, um, you know, in that context, seeing this, these proliferation of really ambitious commitments to ESG and sustainability goals from the corporate sector has been really interesting to a degree, uh, exciting and, and expiring, inspiring, but also, you know, to, to the same degree, uh, really is creating some, some challenges. So, you know, if you look at, you know, I don't want to call any particular company out, but, you know, they'll have massive commitment to carbon neutrality. We have this you know, thesis that uh, it's, it's, you know, critical to our success as a business going forward. And you look at their 10K reports, they're not disclosing any sort of climate related risk. Uh, so it sort of gives you an insight into the level of seriousness uh, that this is, this exists within the organizations. That said, there's some really interesting stuff going on around uh, actual sort of fiduciary level disclosures on climate risk, particularly the task force on climate fin- climate related financial disclosures, TCFD. You're starting to see some really interesting adoption, and and you know that's that's one of the things that I'm I'm hopeful about in sort of the traditional to, to, with equities, especially. Uh, and the other thing in the context of the Great Reset that we're really closely tracking with with Claimate and and is actually a real big part of our value proposition is. So getting out of the equities market is getting in the bond market. So if you look at what the EU is doing as part of their uh, you know, larger uh, economic stimulus package for the Great Reset, I think it's about you know some significant portion. I think it's about three hundred and fifty billion dollars of uh, green bonds, uh, and and so you know that that can mean a lot of things. And and what we're focused on is is ensuring the sort of climate success of, of those bonds, because we really believe that you know, debt is the instrument to finance the solution to the climate crisis. And it's going to look a lot like green bonds and, and their success based on a hardcore climate metric. Are we actually decreasing carbon emissions? Are we drawing it down for the atmosphere? Are we creating And so, and you're also looking at how they all are rethinking their supply chains. Um, and so it's just this really interesting time where there's this emergence of this financial instrument in, in bonds uh, and a real appetite to deploy it into projects that will actually be meaningful going forward. Did we lose you, Peter? Pete, yeah. Yes, yes, we're dropped for a second. Yes, uh, now we're. I agree with what's just been said, and I'm particularly interested at, right at the moment in the notion of uh, governance performance bonds. So uh, we might come back to that a little bit later. But if I take a slightly broader view, um, we're going well beyond what corporate governance was referred to before. It used to be all about directors, and then it was about directors and shareholders, and then it became directors, shareholders, and regulators, and now it's becoming directors, shareholders, regulators, and particularly legislators, politicians uh, at one level. But if we go beyond that, we're getting societal problems writ large right at the moment. And the lack of trust right across the world. I mean, I I work on five of the six continents, don't work in uh, South America, but the lack of trust in institutions is quite astonishing at the moment. And and, uh, Adam Smith warned us way back that um, there were four unlimiteds, as he called them, um, to uh, the formation of this wonder new concept of the limited uh, company, the, the corporation. And the four unlimiteds were unlimited uh, life, unlimited size, unlimited uh, license, and therefore unlimited power. And I think we're now hitting uh, a point where the public, in distrust of the institutions, are asking all four questions, not just about our companies, but also about our governments and about our charities and so on. So we're beginning to get a very interesting pressure building up that will definitely reform the notion of corporate governance across all our institutions, not just listed ones. Um, 
And the growth of stakeholders within that is already you know, fairly well known, but what that actually means is still being explored. Um, and the interesting thing about stakeholders for me is they have new types of power um, over companies, often legal power, but especially at the moment, the social media power they have to um, uh, challenge what is going on. And all of that is coming together to um, uh, really pressure the social and environmental, and I would argue entrepreneurship side of what we mean by corporate governance. Um, E.O. Wilson had a wonderful quote I found only uh, a few months back, say the um, environmental uh, evolutionary biologist rather, um, and he was saying, um, we seem to be entering a sort of 21st century Star Wars, Star Wars culture, where we have Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And he was asking, how the hell do we cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> indeed bob indeed and alessandra again same question i mean what do you do you feel um are the key areas of a corporate and financial governance on esg and impact given the the situation we're in in the world today yeah it's a, it's a great question but also i was really uh, impressed by the breadth and different perspectives of uh, the panel and so what i was thinking was to add maybe a different perspective altogether because what I, I, I see at the moment, there are different forces happening, you know, in, in our society. And, you know, we see a lot of top-down uh, policy-driven uh, change. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, ESG and the regulations uh, which are coming, you know, coming around are pushing very hard for more disclosure and for more focus on, um, especially, you know, the ESG uh, side. And that will surely uh, inform the way that capital is being allocated. But, you know, a, a, as a, a sort of impact uh, advisor and entrepreneur and investor, I see a lot of uh, um, sort of um, uh, grassroots and uh, bottom-up initiatives. And I, I think there is a, a real emergence of, um, I would say, higher awareness, you know, globally, around the issues that we face. You know, I, I think, um, um, you know, Peter mentioned before, there isn't just enough time. So what is happening, I think, is that uh, there is a lot of uh, initiative that is coming out of, um, um, you know, both at the consumer level, you know, in terms of awareness about how their money can make a difference, you know, in their spending and also in their, you know, investing. And there is more and more demand uh, for, uh, you know, for products that can be sustainable. Uh, but I see a huge potential for entrepreneurship. Um, and so that resonated a lot, you know, with Bob. Entrepreneurship as a way of coming up with new ideas of how can we use technology? How can we use our um, uh, discoveries, our innovation, our connections uh, for a better use? And I see a huge potential um, in terms of also what COVID has accelerated. COVID has brought to, fr to the front a lot of uh, societal issues, a lot of externalities that we are not really aware of most of the times. I think they're all coming up. And so it's uh, almost like another silver lining of a pandemic, a global pandemic that is changing our lives is also pushing us to think, you know, more about, you know, what does it mean to do business ethically? What does it mean to take care of our own well-being, you know, physical and mental? I think, you know, mental health care you know, is on the brink of um, collapse globally because we are now uh, sort of facing our fears, you know, our deepest fears. Mm -hmm. And so I see the combination of sort of top-down governance and policymakers coming together with a beautiful emergence of um, a sort of uh, innovation, uh, which is really at the core of creating, I would say, a, a global consciousness around what do we need to do as a society for the survival of our society, because the planet will survive. The question is whether we will be on it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll move quite fast in, in, into the, the next round of uh, questions because it, it really builds upon exactly what all of our panelists have touched upon. Look, in, and again, quite, quite rightly, uh, what you've just also said, Alessandra, look, if economic returns for ESG-focused investments were comparable to conventional investment returns which needed trillions towards socially impactful alternative investments 
Uh, or is there another alternative that you feel is better? Uh, Philippa, if we could probably have your views on that in maybe one minute, that'd be great. Okay, well, I think that there was um, uh, another aspect of that uh, um, question where you were asking, why is the growth of um, impact investment being slower? Uh, in part, which is the point that uh, I'd focused on in my prep, in that I think it's been 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 slow because of uh, the lack of metrics in some of the areas uh, for people actually to make the correct assessments in in doing their due diligence about whether or not to invest uh, in in various uh, projects, or, or which I think is is very much a, a feature at the practical end of what people will be uh, thinking about in terms of um, how, how they do invest uh, and, and the opportunities that they take forward. I think in the main, to the, in the market, uh, it's been so far to the detriment of the uh, innovative innovation and entrepreneurship. I think they have struggled, uh, but I think this is an area which is actually, as, as has already just been very well spoken about, um, that's, the, that's where the opportunities are. And I think the uh, our, people's eyes are open now to a much broader range. If we've turned around vaccines in, within a year um, to the extent that we have, just what else can we do just by harnessing that um, energy uh, in other areas? So um, that, that's why I'm very positive about this actually moving forward. Yes. No, thank you very much. And, uh, and Jane as well, same question. If the economic return for ESG investments were comparable to conventional investment returns, do you feel this would be the, the catalyst to um, create that cascade of, of much needed trillions towards Im impact investment? Um, or do you feel that there's a, a, another um, model or a more apt catalyst or solution uh, to actually grow, grow the segment? So I, I think that um, there's a few aspects here is that, you know, the, the, the question about whether there's a trade off on risk and return for investment in, uh, you know, ESG type of uh, investments versus traditional investments has long been the question. But I think that the, the amount of ESG uh, uh, assets that there are around at the moment and the 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 amount of research that we now have available is actually beginning to show that that trade-off necessarily doesn't exist, that um, you can build a global portfolio of companies that have positive ESG impacts without compromising returns. So I think that's number one. Number two, I think that people that are, want to invest in, in social impact investments are not just looking for the return. Um, as Peter has said, Julia has said, and Alessandra has expressed, they're looking for something more. They're looking to see how we can make the, the world a better place, fundamentally, um, in, in using our investments wisely. So I don't think that the return is the only thing, but I think it's clearly important. Um, I'll just quote you uh, quickly. A study done by Standard Chartered Bank on sustainable investing trends noted that a lack of information is the main barrier against adding more investments in ESG strategies. And while the perception of a lower return versus regular investment strategies appears to be a second hurdle, there is simply a need to create more awareness about the positive impacts. And I think that would be my message. I think we still need more awareness. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. I think we've lost Julia temporarily. Uh, so Bob, um, just the same question. What do you, what do you really feel um, I think we need, in, as far as economic returns um, on, focused on, on ESG? If it was uh, comparable to the investment returns of conventional yeah, investments, but, would that be the solution? Or is there another uh, idea you feel is, is more apt? Well, I think economic returns are uh, beginning to become less of an issue. And these other returns are becoming much more of an issue, which is why I keep going on about E, E, S and G. Um, but uh, within that, um, I mean, one of the things to think about is our time frames. I mean, who, who now really cares about quarterly returns, quarterly reporting? I mean, you know, that's the end of a lot of traditional fund managers. But, um, they, you know, it's not, uh, it's not now an issue. We're beginning to think much longer term. So even annual returns are a bit suspect. But they are beginning to appear, thank goodness, in ESG terms. So that, but the long term is the bit that interests me, and that's why I'm very interested in the notion of performance bonds, particularly in terms of social and environmental and government performance bonds. There's a lot of work going on there, 
And um, at the extreme limit, um, Jane mentioned Mervyn King. The work he is doing along with Jill Atkins at the University of Sheffield is very interesting on extinction accounting. So I'm, I'm drawing a very steep curve from quarterly returns to extinction accounting and saying we've really got to think about this. Indeed. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, Peter, if, yeah, if roughly succinctly in one minute or so, yeah, what do you feel is the uh, alternative? Is, is, do you think economic returns for ESG focused investments, if they're comparable to conventional investment returns, that that is the answer? Or is there another way that you feel is, is a more apt solution? Yeah, I appreciate it. And, you know, I think, Jane, you said it, it it's already evidence that ESG uh, investments are comparable, if not outperform the market. You look at, especially through COVID, there's all kinds of backtesting. Uh, don't don't really need to, to go into that right now. And what I want to talk about, pick up what Bob says, performance bonds. You know, I, I'm really the mindset that you don't really want to be coupled to the market over the next 20 years. You want to find projects that you can you know parameterize, understand what their performance is going to be in the context of what we know is coming in the pipeline on the climate crisis, uh, and you know, frankly, my, my whole mission over these next you know, really 90 to 180 days is to unlock capital flows to these kinds of projects through performance bonds. So what we do, we basically have 3,000 different edge data points around the world that you know, ranging from satellites to different you know buoys and ecosystem monitoring technologies where we can understand and parameterize the climate success of these types of projects and you know, tie that to the performance of a loan. Uh, and that's why you know, we're, we're really excited about this you know, new focus on bonds. One, it's the biggest you know, capital market. Uh, and you know, yeah, they're not as exciting as, as equities, but it's going to be a freaking volatile ride <laughs> over the next few years. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be indeed. And uh, Alexander, re briefly, in, in roughly one minute, again, is, is, is the answer uh, having returns commensurate with conventional investments, or is there another alternative you feel is better? I, I believe that um, you know, uh, sustainability is really the only way forward. And so if we, if we had a matrix that allowed us to measure the broad impact of everything we do, you know, in business and in investing, I believe that the returns of what we call traditional products would be negative because actually we would make emerge the terrible externalities that we currently do not see in terms of environmental challenges and in terms of human damage that we do to ourselves without even knowing it. And so I, you know, in my vision, I think there is no alternative, but of course, at the moment, we are in a system where we are not even aware of those externalities. And therefore, we need to find those products, those projects, those companies, those entrepreneurs, which are capable of aligning the vision of a better future with business models that in, the, in, today's, in today's capitalistic model can make money. And that's the paradox. We are transforming the model from within. We are transforming capitalism from within by demonstrating that investing you know with not only the brain but also with our heart and looking at a very long-term future as rob was saying uh is the only way uh, is the only way we can uh, we can really measure uh, returns indeed thank you very much alessandra we'll, we'll make this very short and sharp um again for to, as a special gift for our audience we'll start with our experts um philippa jane and uh of course bob okay uh in 30, less than 30 seconds, okay, what are one or maximum two key takeaway points, initiatives, or factors you feel the importance regarding governance, structure, um, and, and key drivers that you feel are important to consider for this new wave of economic prosperity in EESG? Uh, Philippa? And then possible question. So I think I would just focus on within the governance structure, within boards, within companies, um, focusing on actually how you're making decisions about all these new areas and these difficulties in order to ensure that the long-term profitability of companies will be maintained. Um, Decision-making is can be very haphazard in organisations. Uh, I would suggest you need a framework uh, for that, which will actually give you a long-term resilience. Uh, it should, with the benefit of hindsight, others come along and say, why on earth in the world did you do that? 
Um, so a framework for decision making, I could say more on that, but I think that's my 30 seconds. Yes, and uh, Jane? I, well, I would echo what Philip has said. I think, you know, in this region, we need to put sustainability on the board agenda. Um, we need to embed it in the strategy and the DNA of the organization. And we need to understand how absolutely crucial it is to the future of the region as well as uh, the organizations. And I think that adopting a framework uh, to work around is, is, your, first, is your first step. Um, and of course, embedding governance in everything that you do, good governance. And Bob as well? Um, I think corporate governance is now faced with a paradox on the one hand, or a dilemma rather more than a paradox, a, a dilemma on the one horn, how do we return to healthy entrepreneurship? And on the other horn, how do we avoid extinction accounting? And that's it. <laughs> Indeed. And for our impact investors, Julia, Alessandro and Peter, um, in 30 seconds, as a special gift and insight, if you had to, for our, our audience reviewing here, uh, if you had to pick one.